Sure. I'll talk it out. Yeah. Let's just have a conversation. Track three. <clears throat> Better not be fucking Dave Matthews band. Okay. Those of you who don't want to be a part of this can leave now. Derek, please listen to me. But if you choose to stay, which it seems like you guys are choosing. Derek, please. You understand and agree to the following terms and conditions. Derek! One. Derek, this is the virus. You talking. hereby waive your right Derek, please. to your own personal bodily integrity. This is not you. Two. Per the state versus Neville Reed. My colleague and I will not be held criminally liable for any felony or misdemeanor that you may be a victim of, including, but not limited to, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, disorderly conduct, destruction of property, mayhem, and first-degree murder. And three, terms and conditions may change or be updated whenever the fuck I want! Consider yourselves notified. All right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. I got news for you, pal. You ain't leading but two things right now. Jack and shit. Jack left town. Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. I was just in my office and I heard a rocket. Describe the rocket, sir. Does this mean we're not friends anymore? All right, DJ Noob is here with you on the Metal Tavern Radio podcast channel, and I am here with my guest, Anthony Jordan from Movies and Gaming, as well as down below in the cellar is Kevin Lambert from The Entertainment Headquarters. Thank you all for joining us for this movie review, which interestingly spawned off of a failed <laughs> project from the other day. Uh, mm -hmm. We were attempting to do another taste of blood for the entertainment headquarters uh, mm -hmm. hosted by that gentleman down in the cellar. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't quite work out the way we wanted to. There was a couple other movies, including this one, that just things were falling through really busy times. So Mr. Jordan had a great plan that this particular movie deserved its own review, which I 100 percent agree to. So that's where we are now. And that's where we are here. So we will be reviewing, of course, 1974's Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter, starring Horace Jansen, John Carson, Shane Barant, Carolyn Monroe, John Cater, and Lois Dane. And the synopsis is, it's a 1974 British swashbuckling action horror film written and directed by Brian Clemens. And let's see, do uh, basically it's a guy named... Uh, Kronos, who is a vampire hunter who goes around killing vampires. And we learned through this that there can be many variations of vampires, uh, something that what we do in the shadows kind of plays with. And what I will do is just go first to my uh, left. 
And that would be Mr. Jordan. Uh, tell me, uh, just give me an idea for when you saw this and how you felt about it upon your first watch. Well, it was when you said, when we were going to do the Taste of Blood, and this was the actually the second one I watched, and like I didn't know nothing about it. I heard about it. I'm like, oh, Hammer movie? Okay, this really piques my interest now. And I found it very fun and interesting. It has its own unique slant on vampires and a nice little mystery about what's going on and you throw in the swashbuckling adventure aspects you know a little bit of romance it's just one of those classic adventure films yeah mm -hmm. mr lambert well i've never heard of the film before believe it or not so what really piqued me interest is the fact it was a Hammer production, because obviously I'm a big vampire fan, a big vampire buff, and I love the Christopher Lee uh, Hammer horror films. So knowing that it was under the Hammer horror, uh, you know, roof, I had this idea that it was going to be, you know, something similar to the Christopher Lee kind of movie, but it wasn't quite like that, but. It was very interesting in terms of the concept of it and the different, like you've mentioned, there's different types of vampires and the different mythos of vampires. And it was nice to kind of see a film that wasn't all just about the blood sucking kind of vampires. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of like under like, you know, sexual subtexts in this, which is something different. And the idea of Captain Kronos himself was quite an interesting character away from you know we've had like the likes of van helsen who's mm -hmm. a vampire hunter we know kind of like his way of uh vampire hunting and this was just a different kind of take on the vampire hunting kind of uh scenario which was interesting yeah yeah it was kind of interesting because i didn't know until today really that beyond they were going to do like a series of films in this yeah. manner from this character but uh, yeah. It didn't do very well in the theaters at the time, mm. but they did end up doing like uh, a series of comics, which yes. I thought was actually pretty rad. I have to kind of see if I can find any of these because uh, it looks pretty sweet uh, in terms of how they would, I don't know how many they put out, but uh, just awesome that they did that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we do have Horace Jansen playing Captain Kronos, and apparently because his German accent was so strong, he had to have a voiceover for his, his actual accent. So Julian Holloway actually plays the voice of Captain Kronos in this, which I didn't know either. Uh, we have Kelly Monroe, of course. Uh, well, first I'll give you a view of Mr. Uh, Kronos there. And then, of course, my babe of a lifetime, Carolyn Monroe, plays Carla. <laughs> And uh, we have John Carson as Dr. Marcus, uh, and then we have Shane Bryant and Lois Jane as Paul and Sarah uh, Deward, uh, who are like this uh, young siblings. And uh, we start the film basically by Kronos, and he has a gentleman that's, uh, what is his name again? Dr. Marcus. No, no, um, oh. the, the hunchback guy. I'm trying to remember his name. Oh, the hunchback guy. Yeah, I think. What did he say? It was Snitch Kara or Hagen? I can't, I don't remember. This, I don't know. Maybe it's this he Kater. It's Cater. Okay. Cater plays uh, Professor Hieronymus Grost. So, Grost, yes. he's like this hunchback guy who uh, travels with Kronos uh, to hunt vampires. And so they end up coming across Carla, who is in one of those old witchcraft contraptions, punishing her for dancing on a Sunday, uh, as they say. So Kronos, of course, unlocks her, you know, cuts off the lock and lets her out. And then she all of a sudden decides, I'm going to travel with you mm -hmm. <laughs> and jumps on the wagon as they head to the next town. Because, of course, Kronos is being summoned by um, Dr. Marcus because they have a an issue where women who are being attacked are aging increasingly fast. And so like they go from young to increasingly old. Yes. And so Kronos, of course, comes there to the town and uh, 
the first thing they're talking about is, you know, maybe vampires. And this is where Gross comes in. He's a little bit more of the historian, the guy that kind of does the research on vampires and stuff. And he, that's where we actually first learn that there are different types of vampires, which again, I kind of made the joke about what we do in the shadows when you have like the, mm-hmm. the uh, type of vampires that suck the energy out of you. <laughs> well, this one sucked the life out of you, but like just aging wise, it's just, that's how yes. they do it. Uh, yeah. So Kevin, go ahead. And what did you think about some of these opening scenes of the movie? Well, like you say, it's not your stereotypical vampire movie. So it like it opens up with quite an interesting twist and like the characters that you're introduced to straight away grab your attention. Like I like the idea of like I said before, Captain Kronos. And like you see the introduction of a uh, what slowly becomes his love interest throughout the movie was a real great opening. And I do like the character of Carla as well. Um she, you know, I like, I like how they introduced. I like how he has like a sidekick, and he's like an ex-soldier from the war, who mm-hmm. also obviously uh, he's asked by Mister Marcus, you know, who's an old friend to go to the village that's plagued by death and stuff like that, and you know, with the high, with the you know the highly accelerated aging, and it was. Just a different take on like the whole vampire mythos, and it's nice to see that you do have like different kind of vampires, not just the blood sucking kind, you know. And it just shows you that there's different types of vampirism out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony, what about you? Early on here, well, similar. I like the opening setup, and you're immediately kind of thrown off because the first attack happens in daylight and you're yeah. used to conventional vampires hate sunlight, even though if you've read Bram Stoker's Dracula, that's not really the case. It just weakens them, but it mm-hmm. automatically builds this intrigue that we're not really dealing with the traditional vampire here and the fact that the victims are found looking like they're elderly when they're relatively young people again mm-hmm. just builds that mystery our introduction to Kronos where he frees her from the stockade was a good scene and it tells you a lot about the type of character he is without him doing anything we get Caroline Monroe which is never going to be a bad thing yeah, I like the scene as well. By I think I don't. I think it's Doctor Mark. I think it's Marcus who says where he says that there's different types of vampires, and I like the scene when he said, um, because it is different kind of vampire that doesn't feed on blood but youth. That they're different beasts of prey. That yeah. I really, I quite enjoyed that element to the open, to the story. Yeah, I think that's uh, something that's kind of really cool about this film is that we see at points where Gross and Kronos are basically doing tests. So the first time we see it is when they're like when he puts like a dead toad into the ground and he covers up the dirt. And then you like put these little, I don't know why they had these like long ropes like things with the bells on like obviously it was to, to trigger whenever somebody's moving around but you had to say to yourself well it's daylight why couldn't they see it so i think mm-hmm. it's more just uh if someone's passing through bre- uh, trees and stuff that it's just gonna move the shit mm-hmm. around and alert them but that was one way that gross was like okay well we're gonna find out what we're dealing with here it's, is a vampire and i guess apparently if a vampire walks over a dead toad if you go back and dig it up it's gonna be alive which was pretty mm-hmm. interesting. And then, of course, later in the film, uh, when we get to that, they they were doing tests to see what kind of death you could give upon a vampire. They didn't really know at this point how to kill this particular mm-hmm. type. Yeah. So, yeah, which is another interesting, you know, thing about this movie. It's not just straightforward or sticking a steak through the heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, I think uh, when they do realize how they can kill, it's like really by accident. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, you know, a couple more uh, girls, young girls are 
found to be aging and they've been attacked. And even at one point, we kind of get the assumption that Dr. Marcus has been attacked, but we don't actually see it until later on. But uh, we're also introduced to the Durwoods, the two twins that we talked about. Uh, they're visiting their dad's grave, and I'm trying to remember what his name was. He was a really good swordsman. Uh, Barlow, I think. Barlow is, I think, his name. Mm -hmm. Funny and, thing called Barlow and this in the vampire. And you're right. Yeah, yeah I was about to say, they're trying Barlow. to use some of that, uh, that mm -hmm. like, uh, connection there with the original. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, their their father had died for the plague, apparently. Dr. Marcus was the one trying to treat him at the time of his death. Now, with the young siblings, their mother is accompanying them, um, Lady Durwood, which ironically, apparently that role was supposed to go to Ingrid Pitt, but she she passed on the idea of doing the cameo for that. Oh, Too bad. That was kind of cool. Yeah. But uh, Lady Durwood, of course, is very old. We can see her face a little bit inside the carriage when Marcus is trying to give his condolences about his, their father's death. And apparently the mother holds a grudge against Marcus for the death of her husband and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't really want to speak to him. So there's some tension there with that, with the siblings and the family with Marcus. Um, but... You know, we all we really see when another of these girls are attacked is like a person in a cloak. It's almost kind of yeah. like the village, you know, Shyamalan, where you just got someone walk around a cloak and the. It's a bit the like uh, another film we're about to do a review on the Night Flyer, where when he arrives at the airport, you don't actually see the killer, but then you always see in the background this long cloak individual walking back towards the plane. Yeah. So it's kind of that that kind of the that part of the plot is kind of very like that like classic vampire. So that kind of adds like a bit of the classic vampire element to the story. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the more interesting things is we get this break because uh, you know with Kronos, and I think I'm just going to say it off the top of my head. Like as much as I love this movie, I think I'd almost like to see like a reboot of it in modern day mm -hmm. with a good action hero. Yeah, because uh, the possibility um, to kind of expand on the fighting skills of the that, of that is actually was going to be a question I was going to ask at the end. Would you okay, want well, to see a reboot, but a modern yeah. day, and maybe not a modern day reboot, but obviously with the technology we have today, to maybe eventually do a film series that was the intention. With obviously, like you see, I would see somebody like Aaron Taylor Johnson. Yeah. Somebody yeah. like that, you know, who... who yeah, could... I was trying to think of any kind of American actor who has both, say, martial arts skills or swordsman mm -hmm. skills, mm -hmm. which would be kind of cool because mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want just anybody taking the role because I think you do... You want to kind of keep it like a John Wick, sort of like he needs to, needs to know the style of how to fight. Yeah, so, maybe along uh, the... Maybe like something like Bleed, give it like that edge. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think that would be very cool to kind of reboot that in a more modern setting because mm -hmm. this was kind of a product of its time as well as the budget mm -hmm. and everything. But it's still very good and very fun, mm -hmm. but it could mm -hmm. use some touch-ups. I feel like yeah, some of the sword fighting was good, but some of it was just swinging, the, swinging it around like children. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. I, and I, I expect that a little bit. But that kind of brings me to this, this tavern where... Uh, the uh both chronos well first you got these three gentlemen are in there they're like mercs or whatever bullies and so they're kind of hanging around and pushing the bartender around the girls in there and whatnot so at some point chronos and gloss make their way in there for a drink and they're trying to get information from the bartender and of course these three gentlemen were paid off by somebody that we find out later is actually representing the durwoods to dispatch of chronos um so of course the one of the lead guys uh who's in there is basically supposedly have decent swordsman he's just the leader of the group and he's trying to talk shit uh so uh kevin we'll go to you how do you feel about this setup of this scene and all that uh uh, really like 
the whole thing with the setup with inside like the bar I thought was interesting and then then you've got like the mass, you know, where he's getting he's got a fight. Is is this the bit where he fights about five or six men all at once? No, is no, this is uh inside the tavern was just like the three guys and they were kind of picking on Gross because of his hump and that's when uh oh, yeah. Ronald basically pushed him to the side says, you know, what if I called you fat or yeah. ugly oh, yeah. or big mouth? <laughs> Yeah, and then well, I like it because it, he's defending somebody that basically can't defend themselves, and he's you know he's sticking up for he's sticking up for his companion who, you know, through no fault of his own has this you know disfigurement, this you know mm-hmm. this disability, and he, he's sticking up for the for, and for the very right reasons. Which I like, which I love these elements because it shows you that the character of Doctor Chrono, sorry, Captain Chronos, is somebody that fights for not just like to defeat evil, but he fights for justice and he fights for the right. You know, he fights for people who do, who need to be protected. Which I really enjoyed those elements of of the plot. Mm-hmm. Anthony, how do you feel about that tavern scene? Same thing pretty much as Kevin. It again it gives you more information about Captain Kronos. He has a sense of honor. He doesn't like yes. bullying and he does believe in fair fair play. He's very much the if you don't start nothing, there won't be nothing type of guy. <laughs> but if you push him yeah, to he's the very fight, much of the uh fuck around and find out. <laughs> Push him into a fight, you're going to be pushing, picking yourself off the ground. And it also shows how close him and his friend are. Yeah. Correct. Well, it's probably. Yeah, like, and that's one reason why I thought down. if they did a remake, it would be kind of cool because that scene where he is so quick on the draw, even though like it's slow to us now compared to some of the action films that we see, yeah. seeing that yeah. done again on a more better budget and you know more uh swordsmen that are a little bit better at swords and fighting and stuff like that like i thought that was a really mm-hmm. cool scene because it showed you just how that badass he really is uh, as a also I, I think when it comes to social issues if you if you casted the character with like a this dis- disfigurement or an ailment like of gross and to have them protect them obviously the way society is with social media and all this stuff it would be really nice to see somebody champion some and have a character who they obviously gross throughout this plot and the story it'd be nice to see if they did a film series for the growth of that character as well and to see yeah. how far you know to build his confidence yes he's been Born with this ailment, but he doesn't allow it to defy him. And uh, yeah, there's a cool didn't... thing where Kronos basically turned to him and said, "You know, God made you this way for a reason." And so, I guess that you was his what, ways. Go ahead. What their dynamic kind of put me in mind of hmm. Brotherhood of the Wolf. Yes, I yeah. very much couldn't help. I can't remember the main character's name, but I very much couldn't help but think of him and Manny, even with those two. Mm-hmm. Sure. Makes you wonder if uh, Manny and uh, the other one was sort of mimicked after Kronos in some way. Mm. But that also led me to uh, yeah. one of the, my favorite scenes uh, with Carla and, and Kronos early on is when he's basically washing up and she's out there kind of teasing him by taking the towel. And he's like, well, I guess she'll be moving on. She's like, no, nah, I think I'm going to stay. And then she's like, if you'll have me, and he's like, "Oh, I will have you. <laughs> I will have you." <laughs> I think Anubis, yeah. you would have her. Ah, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't even know the things I would do. That a <laughs> <laughs> uh, little fun scene between. Uh, she's a very Marla. attractive woman. I'll give her that. Yeah, and she she ends up in a lot of films that I really love around that time, like Sinbad, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and she was in one of the James Bond flicks. She was in uh, Maniac with Joe mm-hmm. Spinell. So she's she's been in the horror genre for a while, and apparently uh, even Dracula AD. Have you seen that one? 
Uh, oh yeah, um, yeah. She's in I've that. Seen uh, Dracula 80. Yeah, so she's, 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 the three, she was. She I had think a it's one of the more underrated films. Well, I'm sorry. What'd you say? I'm seeing Dracula 80. I think out of all the, it's one of the ones I think that's underrated. Mhm. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. All right. So um, he ends up defeating these these mercs that are trying to kill him and. At some point, we get like a, a bat attack on a woman, which that's kind of out of left field a little bit. We don't really see much bats in this except for that. Um, let me see. I'm just trying to make sure we're not skipping over anything. Oh, so then we get to a point where Marcus is shaving and he starts to notice something. At first, I'm kind of like, I didn't really catch it until he started explaining it, but. He comes out and he yells for Kronos, and Kronos is like, "What's going on?" He's like, "I'm, I'm getting younger. <laughs> like, this is not right. I'm getting younger." Then all of a sudden, we see he kind of does this like thing where he shows the fangs. Excuse me for one minute. I've just got to go. I've just okay. got to do one thing. You got it. You got it. Get to Kevin's head and off. By the way, if you hear a kind of buzzing in the background, my neighbor's getting a tree cut down. I can hear show there. Yeah, I think you're okay. So, uh, so yeah, Marcus is realized that when he had approached that cloaked figure in the forest when they were trying to hunt and catch the vampire at that point when they were getting their little groups of bells and shit, uh, we find out that he was attacked in some way and then he was transforming into a vampire himself. So, this is where one of those cool parts of the movie for me is where they're testing to see how they can kill him. Like it, at this point, Marcus is like, you have to kill me. And of course, Gross is like, yeah, he, he would do the same if it was you. <laughs> but of course, Kronos is good friends of Marcus. They, they grew up together. They served in the military together. So it was a little bit tough for him. So they tie him to a chair and they attempt to hang him. They, you know, Done a couple other tests to see if they could, if he would kill him in some way, and it doesn't. Uh, did you feel like I did that? That was kind of the cool things about this, is where it was more like the testing of how because they were learning as they were going about different vampires and how to dispatch them. Yeah, I really like that. That not all there are different types of vampires, and you can't kill any two type the same way. So they were. As bad as it was that he loses a friend, they were also gift-wrapped an experiment to figure out what to do before they go after the vampire. So, yeah, that mm-hmm. was another really cool, uh, interesting scene. This film actually had a lot of thought put into it. Mm. Yeah, and it, it's kind of interesting because they. I'm glad that when they finally kind of explain the film, like even though it says Vampire Hunter, it does have a lot of different elements in it. So... Yeah. It is a little bit of an action movie. Uh, it, it doesn't really go straight into it, as like Kevin said earlier about, you know, you're not seeing like biting into flesh and blood spurt all over the fucking place. Uh, it's not your atypical vampire film. It's a whole different kind of ball of wax. And I don't know if that was initially their intention when they made it. Uh, but it would have been kind of cool to see like a series built upon this, this type of character. Uh, that would have been kind of cool to see. Uh, what did you think, Kevin? Because we were talking about when Marcus has realized he's a vampire and they're now testing to see how they can try to dispatch him. Like they tried to hang him, uh, tried some other methods, and yet nothing was really working at right away. So what was your impression of what was going on? Yeah, well, first of all, I do apologize for having to go away. I had to sort out the situation with the dog. <laughs> for those that are watching, I am currently be dog sitting in the so dog. Your, your cats, your cats, there, so yeah, your cats are always there. good because your cats will sit there and behave. Mine talk. They can't, well, except for Aneka. She is sleeping, but mine yeah. act like dogs. Yeah, half they the time. Yeah. Yeah, half the time when I'm doing a stream or recording, people don't realize, but I could have two or three cats on the bed next to us and they wouldn't even know they were there. The one who's more active is Logan, who always likes to be nosy and see what's going on. 
But uh, anyway, so I do apologise. But uh, no going problem. back to what you've asked is, um, I really quite enjoyed these particular scenes with uh, Marcus. The fact that he's discovered himself, that he's turning into a vampire, where obviously when that happens, two things generally happen. They either accept that they're turning and they kind of turn into their kind of, you know, the stereotypical vamp, blood-sucking vampire, or, like, you, you know, they don't want to turn, but then slowly throughout the time they give in to the in instincts of what being a vampire is. And the whole, you know, kind of what I would say, experimentation on trying to, you know, use Marcus re basically is a way to discover how to kill these things. And the, when they actually do discover how to kill him, it's done by accident. You know, with yeah, the cross. Yeah. They tried to the stake, and the stake didn't work, and but then he accidentally pays them with a piece of silver. Um, yes. And that's what ends up dispatching him. Uh, that's when it gives him the idea. <laughs> I felt sorry for him in a lot of ways because they tried to hang him. <laughs> you know, they, they basically tortured him to try and kill him. <laughs> yeah, and, and that is kind of funny. But it, yeah, it does, get, it does give you a little bit of empathy for Marcus because he really didn't want to be a vampire. Like, he really yeah. wanted to die. But they were having a hard time finding out. Like, me, I'm like, dude, just take your sword and cut his head off. That's got to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, that's the one thing that I was surprised that they didn't try decapitation. Yeah. Um, so probably, yeah, they end, they end up. Oh, go ahead, Anthony. But probably because they just didn't have the budget for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> true. True. Uh, so but they end up the realizing that. Yes, yeah, so they realize silver <laughs> does the trick, and so they go to mm -hmm. the cemetery. They're going to steal this big ass silver cross that they're going to end up melting down and creating a um a sword out of uh that's the work that gross mm -hmm. comes in he kind of is going to be the guy that's going to create this uh sword that chronos can use to kill the vampires uh and they've kind of realized that it might be the durwoods uh that are behind us because they're thinking of course the younger girl who's very youthful and they're thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have a carriage, in, which has been yeah. seen. Yeah. So uh, now as they're trying to get that cross from the cemetery, there's a group of villagers who were very close to Dr. Marcus, didn't, don't understand that vampires exist uh, in their... Um, in, you know, in their midst. They, they just think that Kronos killed Marcus for the hell of it. So they're going to try to get their revenge. And this is where, Kevin, you were talking about the sword fight between the five or six people in the village who are trying to intervene and, and basically take Kronos down as they're trying mm -hmm. to get that cross out of the cemetery. So, again, uh, I think Anthony pointed out that this is where it's fun, but the sword play, you can tell, is very basic. It's just kind of like we're just mm -hmm. dancing around and just flailing and all this stuff so yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very kindergarten so uh, sort of yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well it, it was about par for the course for most sword fights in the back then right yeah yeah i mean you can't be mad about that part of it but it is like you could just tell that like they did the best to try to make him that part of the action here because he, obviously you need something in there because he's as after the tavern thing we have to see him play, which we do see him with uh, Barlow at the end as well. That was a nice little sword mm -hmm. fight there between the two of them. But uh, so, yeah, so now we have Gross who's taking the silver from the cross and he's making a new sword for Kronos to use that's going to kill the vampires, even though they yeah. don't really know who it is just yet. They have a feeling it's one of the Durwoods. Yeah. Uh, and so they're going to put Carla up as bait. And yeah. Uh, Anthony, go ahead. Why don't you explain some of this is what's going to happen with Carla and the Durwoods. Well, they basically just need her as a distraction as they get in, and it's to draw the real vampire out in. We're left thinking it's the one of the siblings, but we come to find out it's the mother, and she's part of, what was it, the Karstein clan? 
Yeah, I think so. So uh, was, the bill, yeah, Lady Dawa, yeah, yeah. But that was a nice reveal because, like, you always knew something was up with the mother, but you wouldn't have pegged she was a vampire, and then she revealed, and your your father's back now, so. Somehow her powers, not only can she drain youth, but it can restore life to the dead I'm taking it. Yeah. It was a pretty yes. good reveal, a Which... nice build-up. Yeah, I think that would have been kind of cool to see because we do, when we finally, I know I'll skip a little bit, but when we finally get to see Barlow, we really don't know how he came to be back from the dead, whether he was already kind of just sitting there waiting or was she feeding him some of the stuff that she was taking? Uh, Cause I don't want to give that away yet either or who, who the actual vampire is outside of that. But yeah. if they do a reboot, I know we keep going back to the remake reboot. It, that'd be kind of cool to see that whole like feeding him uh, the essence that he would need to come back to life. Like that'd be kind of a cool scene uh, they, if they ever did that. They also, with the toads earlier, they, actually did kind of tease that the vampires can restore some form of life to the dead. Yeah. So it came well, back the way you didn't think it would. So I, th I think she basically resurrected her husband. Yeah, uh, and that's but we never really, actually saw that. Yeah, you don't actually see the, any... That would have been like... I know they had budget constraints, but they could have at least done a scene where... You had some soil and a pair of hands coming out of the ground. You know, mm -hmm. he just to tease that somebody or something was crawling out from, you know, uh, you know, a newly, you know, placed grave or something. Just to give it that extra kind of taste of, you know, the horror behind the story. Right. So, yeah, so th they suspect that Sarah, the, the sister, is the one that's been doing the... the excuse me, vampirism out there. So now, obviously, Carla is going to be the bait. She's going to play a young girl running away from home. And the brother, um, Paul, he lets her in. And Sarah's there as well and said her kind of like, well, we'll put you up in a room. And she's like, well, no, no. Uh, I'll just stay on this couch here by the fire. I don't want to impede on you too much. And so they're like, very well. And at this point, we start to see, um, as the night goes on, uh, a figure comes down and turns out to be actually Lady uh, Durwood, who isn't showing any age anymore. You know, she's kind of just herself, uh, young, uh, something we didn't really expect there in the blue. Uh, what we find out from the vampires here is that, especially with Lady Durwood, is that she has the ability to hypnotize, which is definitely something we've seen in vampires and their lore, is that yes. they have the ability to hypnotize their victims. And so she actually ends up hypnotizing Carla first, and then goes and hypnotizes the sister who comes out and screams, because she can't believe her mom is youthful again. She's, like, shocked. And that's what startles uh, Paul to come back down, as well as Kronos, who jumps through Lady Durwood's room, finds like this old mangled, uh, dusty mask, which I guess Lady Durwood was wearing while she was getting youthful underneath. And uh, Kevin, go ahead and pick it up from there for me, if you would. Yeah, so obviously she's now been fully like resurrected to like youth. And, you know, like you say, it's all revealed. And then, obviously, her husband, uh, him and Cro him and Crohn's get into, like, we've just seen, like, a mini duel. And, obviously, Crohn's gets the upper hand. And after this happens, there's that. I love that. You had, like, I think you showed a clip as well of where mm -hmm. Crohn's has the sword. He yeah. has the sword up, and because she's trying to hypnotize him, and so she hold, he holds the sword and shows a reflection back to her, and it's kind of showing her our youthfulness again. And it's during yeah, that this was his time way that of, um, bouncing off the hypnotism back onto her, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that was his way of distracting her. Once he's distracted that, he then stabs her with the sword. And you had that shot before where she slowly turns around and she's de-aged again. And she basically crumbles to the floor. And obviously that's her. No, she is now, you know, disintegrated. She's lying on the floor next to, like, the, the remains of her dead husband, the, like, lying there. Yeah. Which I well, thought yeah, it was exactly a great interesting touch. too because as Barlow and Kronos are fighting, Barlow actually starts to get the upper hand. Like he's a master swordsman, and so he's kind of getting the yes. upper hand on Kronos. And then Gross like throws him the silver sword. And as Barlow goes to kind of impale uh Kronos, he comes by and gets his throat, which of course kills Barlow. Uh who basically drowns in his own blood. And then, of course, at that point, uh, Lady Durwood comes out of her hypnotizing and basically she's got blood in her eyes from crying, I guess, or whatever. And as she goes to try to attack Kronos, she can't because she starts to age very quickly again and basically crumble. She just falls to pieces. So, Anthony, how do you feel about like this final setup of the uh, fight? I thought it was kind of like the fight was kind of basic at times, but it was still a fun, satisfying fight. You got to kind of put yourself again in the, this is the time this film was set and seeing like all the youth come from her all at once was satisfying. Like if I had one point to complain about this whole thing, it's why did he just abandon the sword after the fight? You're yeah. hunting a vampire. Mm -hmm. Isn't there like a possibility you might encounter this type of vampire again? So you might want this special weapon made just for killing this type of vampire with you. I totally thought the same thing. I was like, you know, if you ever saw Desperado with Banderas, he, there's a point at the end where he tosses the guitar case, but then they back up from the truck and he goes back and says, just in case. And, you know, you don't yeah. get that here with this. He never really bothers to come back for the sword. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You just wasted all that stuff or I'm going to go grab that shit. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I thought the same thing. How uh, you, you've got this sword that, you know, kills a certain type of vampire. Your name is Chrono, Captain Chrono, the vampire hunter. So surely... Like you say, any kind of weapon that's gonna, you know, help you defeat vampires because kind of that's your job. Why would you toss it to the side? Yeah, it's like, it, oh, we found our way to get holy water, but man, I don't need this vial anymore. I already beat it. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, you don't know <laughs> precisely. All right, so, uh, yeah, so in the end, uh, they managed to dispatch the vampires. And of course it turns out that the, the siblings aren't actually vampires themselves, but it looked like their mother was intending maybe to bring them into that type of uh, immortality at some point. But she, because they weren't ready for it, she hypnotized them just to get them to shut up before she tried to feed Carla to her husband. But uh, it sort of brings us to the end. Like you said, Anthony pointed out, they just, he, Threw the sword away. I don't know what the fuck that was all about, but uh, so now Kronos is just saying he's gonna go and he's gonna march on and keep fighting the good fight. They're gonna go to another town or whatever. Uh, so he says his goodbye to Carla, which is kind of a weird one. Like I would have thought they would have hugged or kissed or something, but yeah. uh, I found it weird that she decided not to go with him. Yeah, in that the fact that. Offer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. All well, I can say is like, well, on lonely nights, I'll think of you. I'm like, just yeah. take her with you, dude. Yeah. Uh, he's <laughs> really had his, he's probably had his cake and ate it and thinks, right, the next village, I'll get the next hot babe. And the next village after that, I'll get the next hot babe. He's a basically, were, yeah. he's not, he, I mean, he's, yeah, he's a ladies' he, man. I mean, look at that. Yeah, he, I was going to say, he's not, he's not just Captain Kronos, the vampire hunter. He's Captain Kronos, the male gigolo. Yeah. <laughs> he was probably going to be a James Bond-type character with the ladies. Yeah. I definitely. think it was... A to say, that that could have been... Yeah. 
Yeah, Sorry. but that might have been the potential of what they wanted to do with the series leading forward to show different women. So basically, they could have different cast members and then different stories with different villains. And well, they're definitely they going to have to, re if they ever reboot it, they're going to have to really rework it because if you remember the couple of scenes where, well, the second love scene that Carla had with him. He was getting rough with her. Like, you don't see it, but she talks about it. She's like, yeah, you were really rough. And she's got, like, blood on her lip, like, getting smacked or something. I'm like, you're not going to get away with that in this age. <laughs> nope. uh, but, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I still really love this film a lot. Um, I watch it, like, every couple of months. I bought it on Blu-ray. It's worth it for me. Uh, but, yeah, as we talked about, if they rebooted this, I would love it to see it. Um, just have to kind of figure out who would be starring in it at this point. Uh, maybe get some Anya Taylor Joy in there. Maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe get Robert Eggers to do it. How fun would that be? Mm -hmm. Or, or, or right, but, you know? but he's more of a dark, dramatic thing. Would they want to make this like too dark, or would they like to make like middle of the road where it's a mixture of action and? serious and then have that kind of like you know dark humor in where with him i find a lot of his it's very straightforward it's very dark and it like there's no not much humor in it in a lot of his things personally i'd say instead of movies make it a tv series but go the route they do in the uk and just have like 10 12 episode seasons mm -hmm. yeah and I and I would make it R rated. I wouldn't do it like I would go just go all in, you know. Let them fight different types of vampires and stuff like that. Just don't give it the Blumhouse, <laughs> right? <Definitely. laughs> maybe maybe get Flanagan to do it. Mm -hmm. Or oh, I, I think uh, Ryan Murphy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be curious to see what someone like Sam Raimi would do with it. That would be crazy, no doubt about it. the guy, it. Who, oh, the guy who did Evil Dead, who did the last uh, Alien, oh, Alien Alvarez. Yeah, I think he he would be he. I think he would be a good choice because even though I liked Alien Romulus, for me it was basically three films mashed together. They took an element of three Alien films, mashed it together. <laughs> And he did kind of bring the horror element back to it and bring the intenseness the claustrophobicness of it. And it was great to see pl practical effects in it. But for me, uh, he, this is like an argument where we want special effects, we want like practical effects, sorry. And it's a great way to mix practical and, uh, you know, CGI. But how much CGI and how much practical effects do you use? Like the main practical effects, and that was um the face huggers. You saw more when it came to the um aliens, yes, you had the xenomorphs, but I thought they were underutilized in it. It was more about the face yeah, you know, the I had a chance to see that film and like it's not bad, but like I still like Evil Dead 2013 way more than this yeah. one. Uh, I mean, Ramos didn't. It was fine, but it wasn't like mind blowing. I thought it been. I would have thought it been way better. So he's, not, yeah. he's better for straight horror than he is science fiction horror. Probably. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just found, I just found basically the rehashed the ending of Alien Resurrection, but they actually managed to do the hybrid alien um, the way that one of the designs were earlier on when they did Alien Resurrection. Like the hybrid was meant to be more humanoid than alien, and I think mm. they corrected that in this one. And apart from that, it's just a hash of three films mashed to one into yeah. one. And I don't. I couldn't stand that false line in the elevator shaft. There was just no need for that line. It was unnecessary, and I think they missed a massive opportunity for a really gross death scene, or uh, you know, in the in the acid uh, gravity scene where the yeah. aliens had all been shot to death and they were floating in gravity and they were trying to get through. I think the other problem is that. None of the characters are very memorable. 
Like none of them. Like I don't even remember them, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, I did enjoy here though. I did enjoy the lead, but the android for me, he he stole the show. The actor who played the, him, um, I think I think he was the best best of the cast members. And I've I've heard rumors that they want to continue the story of her journey and do another film set between Alien and Aliens, or set between after Aliens and Alien Three with her character. Yeah. Which would make sense as well. All right. Well, let's uh, let's rate uh, Chronos here. So we'll start with Anthony. What is your rating? One to ten. Uh, maybe the seven point five to eight out of ten. I'd probably have to see it a time or two to give it a more solid rating. But based on my first viewing, I'll go with seven point five or eight. Kevin. Hmm. Well, it's the first time I've seen this movie. Um, I liked how it wasn't just your stereotypical vampires. They had some unique concepts in this. I liked the character of Captain Kronos. Well, like you say, it is dated. It is a film of its time. Uh, I'm very much like you. I would like to see this rebooted or at least some sort of other, you know, you know, version of this character brought back. Um I'm very much with Anthony. I'd probably give it seven out of ten. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna still give it a nine. Uh, but this is also one of my more favorite films from the era. So uh some little bit of bias in there, but it does have its flaws, no doubt about it. I would like to see yeah. a reboot of it. It's kind of yeah. deserves one. It's one that doesn't get mentioned too much. Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, like a one all right. thing, oh, just I was just gonna say like that all other films that came before this that might have had similar budget that had more like the horror elements to them mm -hmm. where this for me was more of an action adventure movie or over a horror movie i just think yeah. if they added an extra couple of like elements of horror to this to it i probably would have rated it a little bit higher but for what it is i do appreciate it for its time well i think it does need it like if anything that it fails from is that it needs more fleshed out characters because you have some really interesting characters in here. It's just that you mm -hmm. don't get enough of them. Yeah. Uh, it's really kind of like jumping really quickly from scene to scene. So uh, the pacing is kind of off a little bit too, but again, budgets and everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So Kevin, what do you have coming up on your channel? Well, later on tonight, we will be doing a live Taste the Blood Part 2 where I'll be reviewing uh, Let Me In, Dust Till Dawn, Queen of the Damned and John Carpenter's Vampires. And then heading into the final week of October, I will be editing and getting up on the channel in time for Halloween, my personal blog of Romania and uh, visiting Bram Castle, the castle that inspired Bram Stoker to create the book Dracula and I might still have if I've got time throw out one more vampire review I really fancy doing either interview with the vampire or Dracula untold so if right. I can fit that in I might add that as an extra review to, to wrap up the month of October which of course I've been calling on my channel taste the blood the month of the vampire and then we'll go to Mr. Montober, Anthony Jordan. What do you have coming up, sir? Okay. Within the well, tonight, I'm going to be on the Taste of Blood. Looking forward to that. And the 28th, I have my I have two rankings coming up on the 28th and 29th. Top 10 horror remakes, top 10 horror actors. Also on the 29th, an original story I came up with called Wendigo Journals which is a journal of a guy who's slowly getting possessed by a Wendigo spirit. 30th nice. video essay, why I was wrong about Halloween 3. I'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> October 31st at midnight, Late Night with the Devil premieres, then yes. 3 p.m. Halloween day, my Halloween H2 overview. Very cool. Very cool. As for me, uh, next week, I have on the 30th, 
or excuse me, um, yeah, on the 30th, 6 p.m. I uh, won't be live, but I'll be doing another action film autopsy with Rick Myers, uh, filling in for Samurai Guy again. So I'll be doing another one with that with him with a bunch of oh, movies cool. he's going to talk about and watch. Later in the evening, Mr. Tony the Dead and I are going to do another uh, Ghouls of Midnight. This time we were choosing 81's Dragon Slayer as our movie of choice. Uh, then on Halloween, uh, early in the day, I'll be sitting down one-on-one -on -one with Rick Myers to interview him on my interview series. So I'm really excited about that. And then later in the evening at 8 p.m. Eastern, we're doing a live stream of a review of Lake Mungo. Uh, so I'll be uh, excited to do that as well because I know some people who haven't seen it and I want to hear what their thoughts are, the theories and everything else. Uh, did you ever get back to watching it again, Kevin, or you even got around to watching it again? Uh, I'm going to attempt to do it before Halloween. I will get it done because I want to watch it again to see if a second viewing changes how I feel about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, then on November 1st, uh, I think if I have time, if I feel up to, I might do another Lone Wolf with Dub. I don't know the movie yet, but uh, that's my martial arts movie review series. So once I figure out what I'm going to do, I might have another one of those up before we start the next month out. So anyway, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and review this fantastic film. And uh, <laughs> we'll see you next time on the Middle Time Radio Podcast. Just